Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, very happy to, to have you here. My name is Robert Hendershot. I'm a history professor in the GRCC Social Sciences Department. And I'd like to also thank the college's English department for their very kind invitation to be here with you today. Um, I was asked to come to this year's writing conference to share a few ideas about how historians write, why we write, what we write about, um, and some of the main issues that preoccupy us, which is sort of a big mandate you know, to, to, to give someone. It's rather broad. And uh, I have 45 minutes with, with you all. So my goals are fairly humble. I'd like to introduce a few key concepts that preoccupy historians and how we structure our arguments and written work. And then if you have any questions at the end, I'd be happy to hang out and, and chat with you. But uh, yeah, the title of my talk is Historians and Writing, Causation, Significance, and Evidence. And I think it's always fun to begin this kind of thing with a quote you know, about your topic. And uh, this one in particular has always uh, tickled me. Uh, always scribble, 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 A, eh, Mr. Gibbon? These words were uttered by Prince William Henry, the Duke of Gloucester and Edinburgh in 1781 when he received his uh, copy of, I think, the second volume of Edward Gibbon's magnum opus, his Mona Lisa, right, his, his uh, life's work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, a massive volume, right, delivered to uh, the prince. And uh, yeah, that was his very sarcastic, you know, reply, you know, the, on receiving the second massive volume, always scribble, scribble, scribble. And uh, yeah. Historians were writers, you know, we're always scribbling away. And though few of we historians working today would ever claim to be a modern gibbon, but we nevertheless continue to scribble, filling countless libraries around the world, you know, with volumes upon volumes of argument and analysis. And uh, I always loved this library. It's probably my favorite library in the world. It's uh, the classic hall in the library at Trinity College in Dublin. It's an architectural marvel and it houses, I think, some of the most uh, impressive volumes of, of uh, scholarship ever assembled in one place. A great library like that is something of a mathematical anomaly. You know, it's greater than the sum of all of its parts, right? To have all of those wonderful works and all those ideas and all of that scholarship in one room like that makes it special. Especially that's true, especially in, 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 in the past, you know, before we had the internet and the, the world's knowledge at our fingertips, to visit one great library in the past, to have all of those ideas, all of those scholars speaking to one another in their volumes across the centuries uh, was a very special thing. And I think they still are today, digital, right, as well as physical. Anyway, what are we scribbling about and why? The job of a professional historian when you think about it generally, right, what we struggle with, what the purpose of our discipline is, is to attempt to understand the world we live in better. We attempt to understand as much as we can how the world we live in came to be this way. We use history as a tool to reflect upon and evaluate the present. I mean, that's the utility of history. It's not merely the, the pure love of studying the past. Right, we use it as, a, as an academic tool to try to understand the world we live in. You and I have been born into a time in the world that is beset with many problems and many complexities. And throughout our lives, we will struggle to deal with those complexities. To deal with them effectively, to deal with any problem effectively, you have to know what's causing the problem. And that is a historical investigation. When we write history in our books, in our journal articles, in our lectures, in, 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 in our papers. We have to begin always by identifying a worthy question about how the world came to be this way. And fortunately for modern historians, there is no shortage of worthy questions that deserve scholarly attention. You know, you can't, nobody can do it all, you know, um, Gibbon's book, you know, was uh, very impressive because of the, the sheer scope, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, a massive topic. Most of us, you know, focus on a more particular aspect of how the world came to be this way and attempt to 
analyze that and, and add our own thoughts, right, and by way of explanation. Some historians, most historians focus on one particular subject. You know, we often teach about a, a wide variety of issues, but when it comes to our own personal research and our own publications, we tend to focus on one particular question that will perplex us and preoccupy us, often over the course of our entire career. You know, some historians focus on, you know, for example, what caused democ uh, democratic revolutions to sweep the world starting in 1776. You know, what causes that? Or how did that change society? Or other historians might focus on what leads concepts of gender to change over the centuries. What, what the, the idea of masculinity and femininity and gender identity, what causes that to change from culture to culture or from generation to generation? You know, or, or other historians focus on um, you know, better understanding the dynamics of, of uh, social order, like what causes the emergence of poverty in history? You know, what causes that relationship between haves and have-nots and what drives it? How can we understand that better? As I said, there's an innumerable amount of questions that deserve better understanding and you know, we choose one. In my own work, um, throughout my career, I've been focused on the role of culture in alliance politics. And I've particularly focused on British and American foreign policy since World War II, uh, the so-called special relationship. I've always wanted to know what is special about it, what makes it special, what keeps it special over time, and very significantly, beyond economics and diplomacy and uh, military cooperation uh, and intelligence cooperation and nuclear sharing, what is the role of culture in the relationship between nation states? And I found that, that an answer to that question has many component parts, and I've been able to get out a few pieces of my answer, uh, although I have much work to do. But that's how it goes. So you formulate a question when you want to write history. And then, of course, comes days, months, years, nights, holidays of research. Um, you research as much as you possibly can, and through the process of research, you come to an answer to your question. And once you have an answer, then it's time to begin writing or disseminating, uh, as we say, right? sharing our analysis with an audience. We teach, we write, we publish. What we write about specifically is what happened, obviously, in the world, and what happened in the past. That's an important question to answer, and we turn to history for that. It's not a simple answer, right? It's difficult sometimes to discover the what, but also we go far beyond that as well. We also need to develop a better understanding as to not only what happened, but how it happened and why it happened the way that it did and not some other way. That's a very challenging field. These last two questions, the how and the why, these are what keep us up at night. These are the areas where often historians will argue, often bitterly, with one another. Um, the how and the why questions are more difficult to answer, they're more complex, but they're also more worthy. And it's by seeking answers to these latter questions that gives history its meaning in academia, its utility in society. History is, of course, necessary to write, and it's beset with many challenges. The ancient Greeks viewed history as an art form. And uh, indeed, uh, history had its own muse in Greek mythology. The, the daughters of Zeus were inspirations and symbols of the artistic pursuits. There was a muse for music, and there was a muse for tragedy, and another for comedy, uh, and of course, one for history. Cleo, the muse of history. Over time, it went from an art form into more of a, I, I would hope, a science. And today, we often will refer to the study of history and writing history as a humanity study or, if you like, a social science. But whatever you call it, it's crucial that each new generation engage in their analysis of history. Because how we answer those questions of what, how, and why, it's the way we choose to answer those questions that can teach us a great deal about ourselves here in the present. It's necessary for every generation to reevaluate what we think we know 
about how and why the world came to be this way. Because as, great, as greater writers than I have expressed it, right, uh, as George Santayana has expressed it, history is always written wrong, so it always needs to be rewritten. And of course, the, uh, the, the philosopher and essayist Arthur Schopenhauer had uh, an even more vivid way right, to, to, to phrase that idea, one that sticks uh, in the mind, right, where Clio, the muse of history, is as thoroughly infected with lies as a street whore with syphilis. Um, the idea of being expressed in these quotations is that history is not a static field. It doesn't stay the same. And often when you meet people for the first time and you say, and you know, you're getting to know, you know uh, people at a social function or professionally, and they say, oh, well, what do you do? And you say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a historian. And, and they say, well, usually there's one of two reactions. Either they say, uh, oh, that's really interesting. I like history too. You know, what do you think about uh, uh, the, the Boxer Rebellion or something? And, and then we have a nice conversation. Or the other reaction to you know, learning that someone's a historian is, oh, that's nice. And then they will quickly change the topic. <laughs> and um, if you you know keep going, you know uh, often people will say, well, geez, you know I don't know how you can just uh, you know read the same stuff and think about the same stuff and think about the same stuff over and over and over again. And I find that that idea, you know, has some establishment out there regarding what historians do. And I think that that's a shame for two reasons. One, uh, I don't teach stuff; I teach people. You know, and I think more on topic. The stuff does not stay the same. The information in the analysis of history is always evolving. It's always in motion. Because history is our perception of the past. No matter how many books you read, or no matter how many artifacts you analyze, or how many years you dedicate to the study of history, you never, nobody, nobody can perceive everything about the past. We pick and choose pieces to assemble into a story about how the world came to be this way. And the way we pick and choose those pieces of information has meaning to us. It's a reflection of our values. History is something that doesn't exist in our books. It's something that exists in the mind as much as anything else. History is a something that exists in the present. Without us, without our living minds to perceive history, it doesn't really exist. Old textbooks, I think, are an elegant example of this. Somehow I've ended up with a collection of old history textbooks. Most of them come from the United States, but I have some from other countries as well. Uh, I picked up one in a flea market you know, up in Mount Pleasant you know, some years back. And uh, then I found another one, and then people started to give them to me, and then all of a sudden I had a whole shelf. And it wasn't something I set out deliberately to collect. But uh, anyway, I've got some now. My oldest ones that I've brought with me today, uh, these ones come from the 1890s from the United States. And uh, this one is called The Land We Live In, published in 1898 in Philadelphia. And it's interesting to see what this society in the, in the United States in the 1890s was giving their children, right, to, to read about the history of the nation. And these books, I mean, they talk about, you know, many aspects of American history up until the 1890s. But uh, they're very much a reflection of the 1890s, of the values and the biases uh, of that generation. And I always think about this when I think about Native American history. I've also been fascinated by Native American history particularly, and I've even published a little bit about the history of Michigan's Native Americans. And so when I go back and I look at this book from the 1890s, and I look at the, the, first, chat, or the first section of the book is called The Land We Live In. And the first subheading in the first chapter is called A Land Without a History. America was a very racist place, I'm sorry to say, in the 1890s. And, uh, the, the, the racism of that generation is reflected in the literature that they created. And if I would, I'd just like to share with you the, uh, the opening paragraph to uh, The Land We Live In, 1896. America presented itself 
as a virgin land to the original settlers from Europe. It had no history, no memories, no civilization that appealed to European traditions or associations. Its inhabitants belonged evidently to the human brotherhood. Um, and it, it goes on, you know, like this, right? To, um, to the Englishman, the Frenchman, the Hollander, the Swede who planted their colors in northern soils, they saw only a region of primeval forests inhabited by tribes almost as savage as the wild beasts upon whom they existed. It is needless, therefore, in this book uh, about our country to go into any extended notice of its ancient inhabitants. There was nothing in the civilization of the most advanced American races worth preserving. It goes on like that. You should see what these books, again, that were designed to educate children, you should see what this book has to say about uh, women uh, in America or, 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 or black people in United States history. Uh, it's very much a reflection of the race and gender and social class biases of its time. It's a dramatic example, I think, of how our perceptions of the past have evolved right, over the generations between then and now. Today, I mean, you can uh, find a lot better scholarship out there about Native Americans, right? If you want a good suggestion, I always recommend Charles Mann's book, 1491, uh, which goes into, well, it brings together interdisciplinary work. It's not just history, but it's archeology span and it's ethnography and uh, various different branches of the sciences are, are synthesized to create a much more holistic appreciation for, and it, it develops a very healthy respect for the achievements of Native American culture. Agricultures that feed the world today. You know, f systems of, of uh, environmental philosophy that have much to teach us. You know, I mean, the scholarship about Native Americans has certainly evolved from the, the dominant discourse of the 1890s. As I mentioned before, Contemporary historians are always seeking to improve our collective understanding of why the world is the way it is. The issues we like to write about and debate the most um, both with our contemporaries and with those who wrote before us, are described as causation and significance. In our written work, our theses, our central arguments in our books, our articles, our papers, generally relate to those two topics, causation and significance. That's where the thesis comes from. That's where you argue. It's Like I say, it's not enough just to report what happened. For history to have utility, you need an argument. Right, you need to have some original analysis when you write something. Hippolyte Taine said this very eloquently. After the collection of facts, the search for causes. Why do people do what they do? Yeah, World War II happened, but how did it happen? And why did it happen? That's an important question that deserves an answer. So we must identify causation behind human behavior. We understand what causes the people in the past to make the choices that they make. Then we'll understand why the world came to be this way in a much better way. And then, of course, the other thing that we argue about, that we uh, analyze and present in our written work, is the issue of significance, or what we sometimes like to call in the editing process the so what factor. We often edit each other's work, historians, and often our, our main task as editors is to push one another to establish what is the meaning of this. Now that we understand this history, these events, and what caused them better, what's the so what? Why does it matter? To establish these answers, we need evidence. It doesn't, you know, you're, 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 an opinion, right, is something anyone can have, right? A professional analyst, you know, if you want to present an analysis, you want to make an argument, you need to, it's yours to defend. You know, you need evidence so as to convince your readers. And you have to be specific in your analysis of evidence. In history, you know, we, 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 we research two main different kinds of sources. One you would call primary evidence and the other secondary. Well, you need both. Right, in order to create a successful analysis. For the historian, primary evidence means the oldest artifacts we can find that are contemporary to that period we are studying. Right, primary from the Latin primus, meaning first, 
primary source is any source. It can be written, it can be any kind of artifact that is contemporary to the period that we are studying. And so it can be ancient written works or, you know, for myself, you know, uh, researching the 1960s and 70s a British and American foreign policy, I'll use records from the U.S. State Department and the British Foreign Office, right, that are in archives, right, in London and in Washington, D.C., um, and in other archives as well. Something that is contemporary to the period we're studying, right? So it could be official government documents, it could be diaries, it can be letters, it can be journal entries, it can be the clothing that people wore in the past, it can be the, the ruins of, of, uh, of, of buildings. Even human remains can be treated as primary source you know, information. So many different kinds. By no means is that an exhaustive list, list of everything that is a primary document or a primary source. And of course, once we identify primary evidence, right, the, the stuff that was created during the period that we're researching, then we can think about what that source has to teach us about our questions, about the what, the how, and the why. And of course, this evidence, especially the written evidence, is very rich, but it was created by people, and people are flawed, right? People have bias, people exaggerate, people are sometimes inaccurate. And when they create written work, they pass on their flaws into their artifacts. And so the job of a modern analyst then, a modern historian, we have to go back and think about the bias of the people who created these artifact documents. Think about their agenda. It takes a significant amount of human will right, to, to create a document. Why did they do it? What was their agenda? What were their goals? Who was the intended audience? And we can deduce a lot right, by analyzing each surviving and precious piece of primary evidence as thoroughly as we can. But of course, we'll also use secondary evidence, which are books or journal articles written by other specialists. Okay? Lots of other minds out there in the world have tackled either the similar question or the same question or similar questions as, as, uh, as you are working on. And we inform to one another. We read their books, we read their articles, and we think about the arguments and the evidence that they've presented, and we can learn from that. Right? Either our contemporaries who are alive at the same time we are writing, right? or we might be separated you know, over vast distances of time. But we can read what other people have written, and then in each new generation we can add our own contribution. We can stand on the shoulders of genius and make our own contribution to a body of literature that stretches back into time. We can purge things that are you know, not helpful, you know, in terms of helping us understand, and we can rethink things, and we can introduce new evidence that changes the story. But we have to read one another's work. Look at each other's analysis of evidence. It's a conversation, not a verbal conversation, but in the written works of historians, we are having a long conversation across generations, right? Sharing our answers, developing, hopefully progressing our answers regarding the what, how, and why of this world. So we have to, if we're, if we're going to write something in history, we have to synthesize a great amount of source work, okay, all different kinds of sources. Generally speaking, the more source evidence and the more different kinds of source evidence that you can possibly gather and analyze, the more complete your arguments will be, the more persuasive your final arguments will be. And the answers matter. By way of example, I, I would like to introduce this concept. It's called McNamara's War. It's in quotes because it was a colloquial phrase in the mid-1960s during the, the period of America's escalation of its wars in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War. And a lot of people at this time chose to call the Vietnam War, they would call it McNamara's War um, because Robert McNamara was the Secretary of Defense, right, first under the Kennedy administration and then under the Johnson administration. And You know, they called it McNamara's War because Robert McNamara was, I think, the central driving force uh, behind the American government's commitment to defending South Vietnam and to waging war in South Vietnam. And to understand that war, right, those who write about it must gather a variety of sources. Right? If he was such a central figure you know, in the conflict, right, we need to understand him better. So some have written biographies, and biography, of course, is a, is a useful tool to historians. Right, through looking at his earlier career, 
we can gain some insight into the way he thought. For example, before he became the Secretary of Defense, uh, he uh, was in industry. Uh, he was the first person to run Ford Motor Company who was not a member of the Ford family. And uh, they brought him in you know, earlier in the century right, to, to run Ford because Ford had been flagging. It had been falling behind General Motors uh, and Chrysler in sales. And McNamara's idea right, to save Ford Motor Company largely was about data. He loved data. You know? And so he, he, and he uh, was a pioneer in American industry. He brought in computers right, to, to try to help save and rejuvenate Ford Motor. And uh, you could use computer modeling to predict, predict consumer trends, you know, to, to accurately predict the need for raw materials, right, for the factories, right, to predict labor needs, right, to predict scheduling conflicts. Uh, and with a more accurate assessment of data, he was able to more effectively plan the, the, the corporation's strategy, the company's strategy. The term whiz kid was invented for Bob McNamara in the 1950s, you know, because of, of uh, uh, how successful he was. And for that reason, President John Kennedy uh, chose him to be Secretary of Defense because he was thought to be uh, amongst the best and the brightest, right? That was Kennedy's thing. He wanted his cabinet to be full of the best and the brightest. And McNamara would continue in that position after uh, President Johnson assumed the office. And it was during this time that you know, the war in Vietnam was accelerating. And it was a complicated situation, confronting the spread of communism, domino theory, containment doctrine, etc. Well, anyway, McNamara, in order to effectively defeat what they saw as a communist insurgency in South Vietnam, he uh, needed data. And so, yeah, he would send, the, the Department of Defense commissioned research studies, right, to go to South Vietnam and to analyze several hamlets in South Vietnam. Viet, South Vietnam was a nation of hamlets. There's a few big cities, but most of the people lived in rural communities, small villages. And to make an effective war strategy, McNamara needed data about how many communists there were per region. And what they did was they used surveying and census data and, and uh, you know, uh, analysis through field research. They sent out a few teams into just a few hamlets right in, in uh, South Vietnam. And they surveyed, you know, they tried to create an accurate data set showing how many people were communist um, percentage-wise you know, uh, in, 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 in those areas. And then they brought that data back to the State Department, and they would take the information from just a few hamlets, and they would extrapolate that across the entire population of South Vietnam, which was a significant error, right? Because, of course, South Vietnam isn't the same everywhere. It's different in the delta than it is in the mountains, right? But they tried to adjust for population density and, and uh, uh, the average age and, and uh, the average income as best they could. But they used that extrapolated data, right, to predict how many people were communist sympathizers across the entire country. And then they would give this information to the army. And when soldiers in the war you know, were sent out, they were given data from the, state, from the Department of Defense regarding how many targets, right, how many people they were to attrite in their particular region. McNamara right, had told Johnson about his data, Johnson gave the okay, and this is what happened. And so this is what American soldiers often, not always, but often would have to deal with. They'd have a quota, right, uh, from the Department of Defense. Okay, and you can see the primary documents from the Department of Defense, right, uh, the instructions, there's the reports in the National Archives, uh, you know, from different branches of government discussing this. Soldiers had a quota. They'd have to go out and, uh, um, attrite the enemy. Okay. And they'd keep sending you out in search and destroy missions, you know, night after night, until you hit your quota. After an engagement with uh, communist forces, which was often at night in the forest, you know, second lieutenants in the morning, they'd have to fill out a report, right, about exactly how many um, American soldiers were wounded versus how many of uh, the 
the NLF, right, the National Liberation Front slash Viet Cong soldiers were, were wounded. And then they'd send that data back to Washington, D.C., to the Pentagon. And McNamara would put it into his computers and measure progress. Were they successfully attriting them? It's McNamara at his office. The problem was, of course, is that over time, uh, the primary sources themselves exhibited bias. You know, as the war in Vietnam went on, morale declined. When they first started to send American soldiers into South Vietnam, they told them that they had to do this to defend the national, con the national good of the nation, right? To, to, to defeat the godless forces of communism. And morale was high in 64, 65, and 66, but then it started to decline. And you can see the interviews with American veterans from this conflict. You can read those as primary sources. And uh, you can read biographies that they, or, uh, you know, sort of autobi autobiographical statements that they've made in interviews that uh, morale was declining. And a lot of them realized that this war was not what they said when they sent us here. And a lot of people began to realize that I don't want to die, you know, uh, in a war I don't understand. And uh, nevertheless, the orders, right, would keep sending you out until the quota was filled. And the soldiers didn't want to go, not all of them. Some of them wanted to go, of course, but increasingly, there's pressure right, to manipulate the data. Because once it says that you've filled your quota, you've attrited sufficient enemy, you've hit that uh, SOD quota, right, uh, you might get some leave. And so a lot of the reports coming in from second lieutenants were artificial. You know, they were exaggerated. Also, right, they're inaccurate in another way, too, because the, uh, the Viet Cong soldiers right, had excellent field medics, and they got very good at getting wounded in the forest and not dying. Uh, so it's guesswork combined with bias produces a very uh, inaccurate assessment right, in the Pentagon. But the data right, tells Bob McNamara right, that they're making progress, and then he tells the president that we're making progress. And then the president goes on television right, and, and, and uh, uh, tells the nation, right, that we're making progress in Vietnam, that there's light at the end of the tunnel, that there's hope. Um, and that goes on for years. And we have sources, right, that we have President Johnson's televised speeches. We've got minutes of meetings in the Oval Office. We've got the soldiers' accounts. We've got uh, the second lieutenant's reports. We've got the initial surveys, you know, conducted on behalf of the Department of Defense. All of those sources, when arranged together, tell us a story and it's a tragedy to be sure, right? 68,000 Americans and millions of Vietnamese people would lose their lives, you know, in America's war in Vietnam. Would ultimately bring down the Johnson administration probably more than anything else because after years of promising that we're making progress, you know, in uh, the early part of 19, in the early in the year 1968, right, there was a major offensive called the Tet Offensive in which uh, the communists slash nationalists in South Vietnam staged a major uh, invasion into the cities, right? They occupied the U.S. Embassy. You know, they, they, they nearly took over Hue, one of the other big cities. And eventually the U.S. forces would take those territories back, but it, it, it popped the bubble, right? Obviously, to the Amer in the American mind, it had become obvious to many, many more, than, many more American voters than ever before that the government, when it said that we were making light at the tunnel, that they were one of two things, either they outright lied to us, or they were incompetent. Either way, right, it matters. Did the government lie to us, or were they merely incompetent? How we answer that question is important, right? We have to establish the agenda, right, the causation, the how and why for key actors, as well as systemic problems and circumstances that directed the outcome. Because how we answer that question is important since it influences our perceptions and our biases in the present. And it will continue to do so in the future. This is still living memory. So in conclusion, uh, I know I'm beginning to run out of time and I do want to you know, get to some uh, uh, Q&A. Um, we always have to analyze our sources very thoroughly. Right? We have to sample a wide variety of evidence in order to create an argument about what causes people to do what they do, and what is the significance of that, right? This illustration that I've used today, you know, of uh, McNamara's war, what is the significance of that story? You know, what does that mean to us, right? The way we tell the story, right, has meaning. What does it mean to you? 
and there, right, is, is a part of the significance of history. That's why we do it. So in conclusion, right, that each generation, right, must continue to write history. We have to ask new questions about how the world came to be this way. We have to ask those questions in new ways. We have to use new evidence as it comes to light. We have to invent new methods of analyzing the evidence. Uh, and as a result, right, we will end up telling a story about the world um, that has meaning and utility to us. Our perception of the past will continue to evolve. And so we will have to continue our scribbling uh, because it will continue to be important. Because as the great Tocqueville once said, right, when the past no longer illuminates the future, the spirit walks in darkness. And I find that to be a, a very true thing, both on an individual as well as on a community level. Thank you. But I wanted to leave a few minutes at the end for a, a question or two. Is there anything you'd like to, to chat about? Yes, please. Um, a lot of historians do a lot of research. And how do you deal with researching in older documents where the language or the culture behind the language has changed? Do you often use a lot of translations? And how do you deal with, what if you don't believe their translation or trust their analysis of it? That's an excellent question, and it points to another great challenge you know, with uh, in particular primary evidence, is uh, languages change. Nuances in language change. Pronunciation and, and uh, you know, uh, occasionally it's hard to deal with humor in primary sources because, you know, there was a particular, you know, humor culture at the time and it just doesn't translate, you know, generations later. And so that's one of the things that we'll debate, you know, about what the evidence means. Uh, and you run into all kinds of problems you know, with issues of translation. Uh, one of the best examples that I can think of for that is, oops, is the, the term Ojibwe, the name of a Native American culture here in the, uh, the Great Lakes region, you know, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and Southern Canada, uh, the Ojibwe people. Uh, but often, they're referred to in historical documents as the Chippewa. Um, and indeed, today, the U.S. government still often uses the term Chippewa. The actual name of the culture always has been, is now, always will be the Ojibwe people. You know, but what happened was that uh, the sound Ojibwe was mistranslated. And, uh, what ha yeah, and again, we have to understand the story. Every word has a story. And uh, even that history can be complex. But what happened in this case was that uh, the first European language speakers to come to this part of the world were the French. And they came as explorers and you know, trappers and traders and, and so on. And uh, they met the Ojibwe. And at that point, the word Ojibwe passes into you know, early modern French language, you know, in an era really when there weren't dictionaries. You know, there wasn't standardized language like we know it today. And so French is modernizing. The French language and, and pronunciation is modernizing. And Ojibwe is sort of caught up in that crucible. And then it passes from early modern French, you know, into modernizing French, and then into early modern English, which is modernizing as well. And then, of course, there will be the other later divide between European English and North American English, which aren't exactly the same. And over the course of a few centuries, and over the course of being translated, tra transmitted from language to language to language, the word morphs from Ojibwe to Ojibwa to Chippewa to Chippewa. But it's the same people, you know? But if you have a source in French, right, from the early 1600s, it might say Ojibwe, right? But if you have a, uh, uh, an English source, you know, from their fort up at, up at the Straits of Mackinac, right, they're talking about the Chippewa, and it gets very confusing, or at least it did, right, before this knowledge of the culture and lang language could help us sort out which group, you know, was which group um, when we study the history of the Great Lakes region. Yes. Have analysis of other works first, or you can, you know, have uh, secondary works that are written about, you know, language or you know, studies done in foreign language primary sources. Uh, like for example, I've been interested in in, uh, in the the Mayan civilization for a long time, and I, I will 
happily read secondary works published in English, but I don't speak Mayan. Uh, and so I'll never be, probably won't ever be an expert in, in, in Mayan source research. When you go to grad school for history, when you do your master's and your PhD, uh, you choose your specialty quite early. And you know, if you wanted to focus on the, uh, the history of uh, you know, the Spanish conquest of uh, the Caribbean, you know, they would look for you to, to be able to, yeah, right, you, you'd have to become proficient in, 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 in Spanish and be able to do primary source archival research in the original sources uh, from that time period. They probably want you to ideally not only uh, Spanish, but maybe also Portuguese uh, and maybe an indigenous language as well. You know, I mean, that would be very interesting. You'd be able to, uh, it would open up doors for you as a historian who sought to specialize in that. That makes some fields of history very, very difficult. Like, for example, the Ottoman Empire uh, was, was a, a, a linchpin of world power for many centuries. And, you know, it sat there right at the crossroads of Africa and Asia and Europe. And it had so many languages within it. I know it, yeah, and even the government documents uh, operate in several different simultaneous languages. And so for a historian to write a history of the Ottoman Empire, it's Stunning, right? Because how many languages can you really expect one historian or one team of historians to be able to research it? Um, so yeah, every field has its challenges and, and certainly language and the analysis of language and, and uh, the nuances of, of the written word are, are always going to bless us with work. Yeah. Good question, please. Well, there, there's, there's lots of them. Uh, of course, you have to be good about citing your evidence. You know, if you want to persuade an audience, uh, you have to analyze your evidence thoroughly, but you also have to constantly keep your readers dialed in on what evidence you're analyzing. How do you get to these conclusions? And so citing your sources in a standardized format is, is essential right, to creating a persuasive case. And also that informs that dialogue I mentioned between academics across hundreds of miles of distance or hundreds of years of time. You read something else written by someone else and you think, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. I must know more about it. You look at their footnotes and it, it's like a map. It takes you exactly to the primary evidence that that other scholar analyzed. And so they build community and they extend analysis. So proper citations. In terms of structuring arguments, Beware the logical fallacy of post hoc, ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore because of this, in Latin. It's a classic pitfall, right, that many historians fall into. And when, in our attempt to establish causation, right, always avoid the after this, therefore because of this train of logic. Correlation does not equate causation, okay? Um, the classic example of the logical fallacy is that, you know, first the rooster crows, and then the sun rises, therefore, the crowing of the rooster, say again, makes the, makes the sun rise, good. And that's obviously not the case, right? The two events, the crowing of the rooster, you know, and then the rise of the sun, they're correlated, you know, in the timeline, but one does not have a causal relationship upon the other, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, you have to go beyond establishing correlation. Causation is more than that. For example, I had a, a, a student working on a research paper a couple semesters ago, and they were looking at the causation uh, for mass atrocities, genocides. And it, it was really good work, and they were looking at the role of mass communication technology in, in, in what would lead people or to, to, to commit such mass atrocities. And they were using uh, uh, Germany, World War II, and they were using Rwanda in the 1990s. And what they found in both cases was that uh, the government's attempting to whip people up into this uh, frenzy of, of fear and, and, and violence used the radio with great effect, right? And, and uh, they used mass communication. And so in their research, what they were able to do was uh, transcribe radio programs 
you know, and look at what the government was pumping out as hateful propaganda, you know, again and again and again. And then they showed that the, 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 the genocides happened. And they, that was the first draft. And it was a solid first draft, but as their editor, I had to say, you know, that uh, you know, what you've got here is correlation. You've not yet quite established causation. First, you were, you're able to show that the, the radio, right, uh, was used to transmit this propaganda, and then you show that the, the atrocities happened. But we need to take the analysis further, right, in, in to, to, to establish exactly how and why Right, the, the messages on the radio contributed to the actual violence. And then that was, so it was back to the drawing board, but they found more evidence. They found first person accounts of people who had been involved in the, uh, and survived you know, the atrocities. And they talked about the role of that propaganda campaign. They talked about how people committing the violence would repeat what they'd heard on the radio. Uh, and, and they talked about how it made them feel. And uh, so he was able to take the argument from correlation to causation just through a little bit more research. So yeah, just because A happened, then B happened, it's not necessarily the case that A caused B. Be very careful in how you lay out your arguments when you construct them. Um, post hoc, ergo propter hoc, after this, therefore because of this, is a classic logical fallacy. So I always warn people when they're constructing arguments about causation in history uh, to, be, to be thinking about that. Right. Well, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure. Have a nice day. Pleasure. <laughs>